Um, so my job is to take you through some of the background science because um, if you're like me, um, years ago I tried to just reduce sugar or even get rid of sugar out of my diet, but it was very, very difficult. Uh, everything I ate had sugar in it, and uh, I be was, was quite confused and frustrated at just how difficult it was to, uh, to actually reduce it at, or at, at least even address uh, the challenge because I still like to go home and eat chocolate. I still like to have an indulgent snack every now and again, and so it's difficult uh, to have them... Um, without sugar in them. So, uh, but I wanted to hit, uh, hit the crux of the issue for you or address the crux of the issue. Behind most disease processes, whether it be cardiovascular, uh, there's, uh, or there's some sort of inflammatory component, whether it's cancer or joint disease or anything like that, there's, uh, there's an inflammatory component to the disease. If you Google, I've just uh, posted this for you, so that if you Google the top inflammatory uh, foods, you'll see the sugar is right at the top. Um, if you Google the anti-inflammatory foods, uh, then, um, then you get all of these um, fruits and vegetables. And then so I thought, well, what we do is just dig into garlic, for example. Garlic is, a, um, uh, is an, a, one of the top anti-inflammatory foods, and yet it is, um, it, it is 20 to 30 percent um, carbohydrate. You can see there's sugar. So it's not sugar. Sugar is not the problem at all. It's actually what we're doing to refine the sugar. So we don't refine garlic and get the sugar out of the garlic and then get rid of all of the other nutrients. All of these are the product products here, which is exactly what we're doing with white refined sugar at the moment. So white refined sugar is essentially just the carbohydrates and everything else is thrown away. So Sophia, if you look at what we're doing historically, anyone who's had anything to do with the sugar industry knows that the old way of eating is just chewing on a sugar cane or some of the older products, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but in essence, what's happened is there's that um, white refined sugar is removed in a garlic context, all the sulfur compounds. So in, in um, a good polyphenols, Sophia, so flavonoids, polyphenols are left in the sugar, and so we now leave those in the sugar. Um, they're in, in, Dutch, in indigenous sugars, the old-fashioned sugars, they're all there, um, but they've been very difficult to measure and monitor, and so the technology we've used, uh, which I'll show you in a second, is actually uh, allowing us to keep those compounds in consistently so that there's no variability. So in essence, it's not sugar, it's just the... It's the um, the refining that's the problem. So Consumers are waking up to the fact and desiring foods now that are less processed. And so that, um, that's partly behind what we've done. So here's some of the older, if you've been familiar with these old indigenous sugar, there's jaggery, uh, that's an Indian product. Um, from um, South America, there's, there's all sorts of other rapadura products. There's some um, uh, from Af Africa, South Africa's Mauritius, there's um, a Demerara, there's all sorts of, of old-fashioned uh, products and coconut sugar, for example, and that's how they're made. Um, they leave everything in it, they boil them down into a little tub. Very expensive, um, but they're because they're handmade, they're not industrial, but there's lots of evidence. Um, this is one particular paper uh, that was in 2012, uh, talked about um, the, the benefits in, in, in including of these old products decreasing the risk of diabetes and obesity. So why aren't these products used? Well, the problem with these products is that they're very, very sticky. They're very, very uneconomic if you're a food company. Um, they're very, very uh, inconsistent. So there's no technology. They just boil the juice and pour them into a, um, a container. They taste great. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're a great product to use, but they're not a one-for-one -one, uh, swap in branded recipes. And also, they're too expensive. So if, if I owned a Mars bar, and I wanted to put this into Mars Bar, the Mars Bar would, instead of being a dollar, it would be uh, 15 20 $30 a Mars Bar. So it's not, not affordable. Uh, so it's not a one-for-one -one swap, and it's certainly not an economical swap. And so the white refined sugar is difficult. There's been some good studies about this, but, di but refined sugar, so my experience, is the same as most. It's very difficult to get out. Um, in, in beverages, it's somewhat simple uh, because you can just put in a... Um, an intense sweet and you can get away with this. But in a food where it's used as a filler, uh, it's used for taste or as a binder in muesli bars or cereals or anything like that, or it's used as a preservative or even as a fermentation substrate, there's difficulty there because you can't get rid of sugar in that instance. And so if you're a food company with that type of issue, then you're, you're stuck. There's absolutely no option. There's no industrial option other than white refined so sugar. So I'll now dig into the science, which is my job and matter, will then go through how, how we're commercialising this at the moment. But in essence, I'll just summarise this for you. Um, but in essence, it's still 100% natural cane sugar, so no, no chemicals added, there's no processing aids, there's nothing like that. We just leave in and um, uh, monitor the refining so, or the processing so that it's less refined. So it's out of a primary mill, so we've actually cut out the refining step completely. Um, 
It can also be, uh, be produced in any, any sugar mill as well. So it's retrofitted to existing uh, sugar cane mills, if you like. Now we get to the favourite part, so I can show you. Uh, what I've done is quoted other people's research. I thought it was unfair to quote my own at this point, um, or, uh, but these are groups that I'm familiar with. So this is, um, uh, this is essentially how sucrose... So sucrose is a double bond, a, a disaccharide. It's actually broken down uh, by these digestive enzymes in our gut and then liberates both glucose and fructose into the bloodstream. So that, that uh, in inst instance, it's the same thing, Sophia, with the green tea polyphenols, if you like. So they do the same thing. Very similar research has been published uh, on this. So, so these, these particular compounds, the flavonoids and phenols, are well published and actually br uh, block that enzyme. So what it does is just you taste it. It's all sensory. It's still the same but there's less of it actually digested, so it changes the metabolism. So by removing these things out of the, the natural sugar, if you like, then what happens is you're, just, you're liberating all of the glucose and fructose, whereas if you leave the phenols and flavonoids in, and only a very, very small amount. There's two proteins. Actually, I'll just skip to the next one for you. There's two proteins. So this is all of the intestines and the bloodstream. And then, so what happens is it, the, the sugar actually, is, so if, if it is digested, it actually hits the SGLT1 and then gets shot across to GLUT2 and then into the bloodstream. It's, it's a protein mediation uh, and carry. And so uh, what happens is there's SGLT1 and, and, SGL, uh, and, and GLUT2 are actually inhibited by the proteins as well. So to answer that question, what happens is, is that the sucrose just stays here, it doesn't get metabolized and just goes straight through into the gastrointestinal tract and excreted. The, nat the natural mechanisms, of course, it, it, um, and it works quite well. The GI of the, of the product then is then quite a lot lower, about 30, uh, 30 plus percent lower. Um, you can see what happens in high glycemic index foods. Um, this is the, that's blood glucose over time. The problem with high GI foods is that the blood glucose then rises very, very rapidly, and then there's an ensuing um, insulin, um, insulin sensitivity actually becomes a problem in this instance because then insulin then is released, and then as insulin's up over here, it shadows there, then what happens is, is that you start to feel hungry again, your body's looking for more carbohydrates. And so what happens with low GI carbohydrates is that they actually then uh, lower and flatter, and so the energy is actually a sustained release. Again, with the glycemic index and uh, low GI foods and that strategy, that's well published. Um, that is, um, uh, there's some big studies that have been published on this. There's some um, Cochrane reviews on this as well. Um, you can see long, stu long studies over um, a period, long period of time reduce um, the risk of diabetes. Uh, and high GI diets actually increase the, the, um, uh, the, the risk of diabetes and obesity. So and essentially, what we've done is shift to white refined sugar. And then it, it's the same with starches. It's the same with any refined carbohydrate. By the refined carbohydrates, uh, what we've done is move the glycemic index up in our diet and then increase the risk of diabetes and obesity. So now the challenge for our next generation will be then to reduce the glycemic index of the diet 